All right, I'm going to have my guest come on here, Justice Whitethorn, uh, and have a seat. And we're going to start talking about uh, state politics and running for office and uh, just what's going on in our uh, local government and in our area and what the representatives are doing down at the Capitol and spent, spent some time uh, with talking about Minshew and what's taking place there. So, Justice, good to have you on <laughs> well, again. Tim, yeah, yeah, great, great to see you again. Thanks yeah. for having me back. So you um, were just down at the VFW, right, before you came here? I was. I uh, had a couple, I was, I go out knocking on doors, introducing myself to people, and uh, uh, one of the gentlemen I said, say, look, you got to come down to VFW on Thursday so I can talk with you. So I did. I drank a Coca-Cola, and they said, great to see you again, and then I came right over here to the uh, over here right, to your right show. here, yeah. yeah, yeah. And uh, I understand you you got a lot of signs up now. A lot of people are putting your signs up. Probably yeah, the I most don't know. Uh, <clears throat> in a long time. Maybe uh, 250 or so signs uh, we've gone through so far, and have uh, several more of them that we haven't yet put in yet. And so, yeah, it, it looks nice. People are starting to recognize me and. People uh, honk their horn and, and wave at me as I'm out knocking on doors, and people recognize me as they walk in by. So it's it's been very exciting. I I really enjoyed this. This is this has been a great time. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Uh, it is it is a fun time, and you do meet a lot of people, and mm -hmm. uh, it changes things for your life in that process. Mm -hmm. uh, it's it's fun. <laughs> it, it I, I've been, been through that. I've you know full disclosure. I've ran for state rep in yeah. part of your area. I, I got to tell you, in, in the beginning, uh, I was actually very nervous, a little bit afraid, but I was thinking, you know, there were uh, 54,000 Marines that died on Iwo Jima, just one battle, mm -hmm. and every single one of them that went had to know that there's not much of a chance that they're, they're going to come back. Right. But they went anyway. Right. And, you know, thank God that they did. Right. And uh, as I'm watching the news uh, these last couple of years, I'm more and more afraid. I, I'm afraid. I'm very apprehensive about the direction that our, our government is going. And once I decided that I was going to run, then I was no longer afraid anymore. It's mm -hmm. just like when I was in the Marine Corps. <clears throat> Once you make that commitment to go, then, then the fear goes away. Right. And I think that more, more of us need to actually do that. There's a lot of people who are afraid. Yes. Uh, uh, I just had someone tell me that he, didn't, he, he wanted to contribute to my campaign, but he was afraid. <laughs> He, of? Uh, uh, being audited by the IRS. Oh, oh right. They don't do that. No, well, I hope not. For campaign contributions? <laughs> no, no. Well, oh, anyway, well, maybe he, they do. <laughs> he's afraid. It's it's like if someone finds out that he's a conservative, he's afraid. He, I don't know. But, but I want to encourage that is, people, don't be afraid. That is part of the plan right. uh, by the far left, and by the communists, is mm -hmm. to make people afraid and to intimidate people into not acting and right. um, and not doing what a individual has the right to do. Right. Don't do it because, you know, I, I'm coming after you. And I just, I just want to encourage everybody, don't be afraid. I mean, yeah. I remember when I was a little boy in Sunday school, uh, we used to sing this song, uh, This Little Light of Mine. Right. Yeah, I'm going to let it shine. Mm -hmm. and you don't want to hide it under a bushel. Uh, you need to let your light shine. Yeah. And I think once that people make the decision that, yes, I'm not going to be afraid, yes, I'm going to let my light shine, then the, the fear goes away. Mm -hmm. And don't, don't be apprehensive. Just go ahead and, and be who you are and tell the truth. And, you know, we shouldn't be afraid in America. Right. This is a free country. Uh -huh. um, so that the idea that Americans are afraid of their own government, which is really what I'm, I'm getting as I'm out knocking at the door. Well, this the, is a very dark day in the history and the, of America. Look at this traffic stop that just took place. Yeah. I mean, and the things they start throwing out and accusations mm -hmm. and trying to, these officers are trying to raise the level of confrontation mm -hmm. by doing a false accusation that they know is false. Right. And mm -hmm. so that, that's just not helpful. Our government employees our servants should not be doing that type of thing. Right. Well, you know, we have a reasonable expectation of, uh, you know, our rights to be enforced and protected by law enforcement. Now, law enforcement has a, a difficult yeah, they, job they do. while they're out there. Absolutely. But yes, uh, it does appear that 
there is a, a much greater level of apprehension and fear of the government uh, than there, there has been in the past. And that's, that's exactly what I'm getting as I'm talking to people. And, mm -hmm. and also, one thing that seems to be coming out is uh, people seem to be under the impression that like the, the, the government is being just plain disrespectful to us. Right. Uh, and that's, that's another uh, theme that I'm getting as I'm talking to everybody. Yeah. But, you know, there are good people in government and there are good causes that are out there. In fact, you're talking about uh, uh, Guardian Angels Catholic Church actually al allowed me to come to a listening session and I had an opportunity to speak for a little bit and just was on October 2nd. And to see the people who are concerned about what's going on in our communities and they mm -hmm. really want to make a difference, mm -hmm. that, that's inspiring to me. Right. And it was, it was a very good experience. Uh, I really enjoyed that quite a bit. Um, now, you gave a, they like about, I don't know, 20 tables. And uh, people from the community sat at the tables. And then they asked candidates to sit at the table. Then they would ask a question. And people at the tables would talk. Mm -hmm. and, and then they would have, at the end of maybe a five-minute session, they would ask a couple of the candidates to talk about, just introduce yourself and talk about what you've heard uh -huh. ab about the people as they were discussing poverty. And that was really mm -hmm. the, uh, the topic was discussing poverty in our communities. So I was the last one to speak, um, and uh, I, I did enjoy myself uh, very much. I did have uh -huh. an audio as well. Okay, um, well, we got that audio, so we, we want to play that now. You know where can yes. you get to the play button? Yes. Okay, so so this is me uh, when I had my, my okay, short Okay, let's short bring that up on yeah. the... Uh, Here is Justice uh, White Thorn uh, from uh, 43B. Uh, hello, I'm Justice White Thorn. And, uh, I'm not a judge or a lawyer or a sheriff, justice is my name, and, I, and there is no great story behind how I got that name, although I have made up several humorous stories over the years just to get people off my back, so if you want to hear one of them, you can ask me when we're finished. Uh, just a few things about me. I was raised in uh, the Salvation Army. My, Salvation, my father and mother were both Salvation Army officers. Uh, we made a lifestyle out of ministering to individuals in poverty. It wasn't just a profession. My father always um, kind of shunned what other people called the professional boundaries. The individuals that we served were the people that uh, little children would, I would be invited to their birthday parties when we were growing up. They were invited to my birthday parties. They stayed in our homes. Um, they were my friends, my, my family, my hero. Uh, they, they were right there with us. I joined the Marine Corps because when the first Gulf War broke out in 1991, I had to serve my country. I just had to. Um, it, it almost wasn't a choice. I just had to join. So I joined the Marine Corps uh, during the first Gulf War, and I traveled around the world and saw many uh, countries in abject poverty. Uh, one of them was the Philippines, where I lived for one year. One of my jobs was to guard the garbage because the Filipino people would come and try to steal our garbage. I remembered the lifestyle that my father instilled in me and I would still give to the poor people who came. I made many friends. It spread to my entire platoon and my company who also started giving their own food to the people who came. Old men used to come and ask me, they would beg me to marry their daughters to take them away to live in America. I was just a 19, 20 year old kid. When I came back to the United States, I saw my country a little bit differently, and I appreciated the great things that we have. But we still have poverty in the United States, and I still continue my personal lifestyle to do something about it. Uh, normally, I've insisted in living in uh, communities that are diverse and also what other people consider impoverished. Uh, three years ago, I moved to Oakdale. Uh, which was the first place I lived after I got out of the Marine Corps in 96. Prior to that, I was in Frogtown. Um, I saw great poverty in my next door neighbor. Um, a seven year old boy, he lost his arm. He used to come over and knock on my door and ask for candy. I knew that uh, what he really wanted, he just wanted a man in his life. Uh, after about a month, I noticed he didn't show up. I went to his uh, house and asked his mother where he was, and he had died. About a year later, his, I met his father for the first time uh, because he moved in with his uh, mother because he got shot and lost his leg in a drug deal. Uh, my brother who lived across the street uh, was in an abusive marriage. His wife took a pair of pliers and clamped it onto the little girl's, his daughter's ear and uh, did some considerable damage. Eventually her violent fits led to her to commit suicide in front of him. 
organizations used to come to me and ask me to harvest my relationship with individuals in poverty. I, my wife is Hmong. Uh, the organizations would ask me to uh, harvest my relationship with the Hmong population because I have some rather extensive ties with individuals in, in these demographics. And I would always tell them the same thing. Um, you're going to have to make the, take the time to build the relationships, to really build the relationships. Um, because no matter how great your system is, a system, we need systems, but systems are not humans. They can't love you, they can't understand you. They, and uh, we, we need to do the best we can at an individual level as well. Thank you. Thank you. All right, well, that's, uh, that's fantastic. Yeah. Uh, well, it shows your, I mean, that, I mean, that's you. I mean, that describes you, your personal nature, your, your involvement in people's lives, and your uh, ability to understand people. It, there did seem to be a stark contrast between, uh, you know, what I said during my, my period of talk and any other incumbents or candidates. Uh, I talked about a, a personal lifestyle, something that I had been living all of my life, uh -huh. uh, where everyone else talked about um, some ideas that they had or maybe uh, something that they could implement at the systemic level. Uh -huh. uh, I was talking about, you know, I've, I've done this, I've lived this. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it just it isn't something that um, I do from the ivory tower of the board of directors. You know, it isn't something that I do by, you know, simply uh, throwing money at a collection paper and then dismissing it. This, mm -hmm. this is something that I, I have lived as a personal lifestyle uh, since I was a child. And it's, it's a, a great privilege to be able to, to do that. I'm very, very happy. You know, my life hasn't been perfect, but I, I've got a lot to be grateful for. Well, you weren't out there forcibly taking money from people and giving it to other people. Right. Pe and people would volunteer their money and their mm -hmm. time and their relationship to get to know people and help them out of the poverty. Right, and that's, that's not to maintain it and to leave them there, but to help them get out. And that's exactly what has to happen if we're going to do anything about poverty. Um, if I advocate um, that you do something about poverty, uh, that doesn't make me a generous person. No. If, if I say, you know what, I think uh, the government should raise your taxes because I'm inconvenienced by that person over mm -hmm. there in poverty. Uh, the fact that I'm advocating that doesn't mean make me a humanitarian. Right. Uh, you know, we, we've got to live what we say we believe. And yes, we certainly need a systemic change. We certainly need, um, you know, government programs. But we can't absolve ourselves of our responsibility to our neighbors. We can't shirk our responsibility uh, to our family members and, and to our loved ones and to our neighbors mm -hmm. off onto the government. Right. Uh, certainly, by all means, let's let's have good, uh, sustainable and, and productive government programs. But it, we have to have more than that. And I say that individuals in poverty deserve more than that. And mm -hmm. I say that we, as a real as people, uh, owe our neighbors more mm -hmm. than that. Mm -hmm. The government program, okay, let's go ahead and have some, but we can't stop there. Yeah. Got it. It's got to be. It's got to be from the heart. It's got to be yeah. also at the individual level. Yeah. Um, so one of the programs that you've, well, that's just been implemented mm -hmm. in, in, in the design to help the poor, mm -hmm. uh, which didn't provide them more care. It just provided them insurance. Right. Uh, they didn't get <laughs> health care. They got insurance. Right. Uh, that may help them get health care. Mm -hmm. It may not, mm -hmm. but supposedly it's supposed to increase insurance. So you've been following that. Yes, yes I have. Uh, so uh, Obamacare as it comes to Minnesota, it, it turns itself into MNsure, which is the Minnesota version of Obamacare. Uh -huh. So Obamacare MNsure is essentially the same thing. Um, it, it is not providing what it was supposed to have provided. And uh -huh. it's called the Affordable Care Act. But who exactly is it affordable to. As the people who still have to pay their own insurance have to pay higher premiums and they get lower quality insurance. Mm -hmm. uh, but my, the thing that I keep hearing at the doors is people are just frustrated at the fact that uh, the people who are uh, advocating this refuse to admit that it's a complete and utter failure. Mm -hmm. I mean, come on, wh what has to happen? So some of the things like let's well they don't know how to fix it either, right? Well, I mean that's that's why they have to stick with it because they don't know what to do. 
to fix it. Mm -hmm. And pr frankly, it, it can't be fixed, right. in, in my opinion. But well, you, you may be right about that. I mean, in order to actually fix it, it, it would have to be something that would be so completely and utterly different, different yeah. right, that it's, it's not the same animal. Right. And so if we keep the same name and, and change it so drastically that it's not the same thing, is it really the same thing? Well, one thing I want to bring out here before we get any further, and you may want to show, show that up. So push the escape button first uh, and, then, and then click out of that by the red dot up there. Uh, get out of there, yeah. Mm -hmm. And then what uh, your opponent, Leon Lilly, was a big supporter of Minsure and the Obamacare style health insurance, not health, health, uh, uh, right. not getting you health. Right. So not health care, not health care, health insurance, but health insurance. Right. So um, he, he was a big proponent. Yes, he's one of the help, sponsors of the bill. One of the authors, uh, yeah. Now, I do want to say that um, in my uh, limited interactions that I've had with Leon Lilly, uh -huh. I want to say he has been a very pleasant gentleman. Yes. Although I certainly disagree with his politics. Well, here's the deal. But to his credit, uh, he has he's, been a very kind, he's pleasant, pleasant gentleman. But yeah. he's picking your pocket. This is yeah. my saying this. I know you're not saying that. He's picking your pocket and he's providing more regulations and he's taking away your liberties. Yep. So how good is it to have be a gentle person or be a gentleman but then steal and rob? And yeah, that, that's a great point. That's a great point. Uh, you know, his so politics, I disagree with his politics. <laughs> uh, I do want to say that uh, every interaction I had with him been very positive. Yep. Uh, although he won't let me get my picture taken with him. <laughs> I've asked him several times, may I get my picture taken uh, with you? Part of uh, <laughs> posterity, part of history. <laughs> right. Part of right. A, keeping a record. Right. Well, uh, well, well, perhaps will he, after will this he is let you debate? Will you, he let you debate him? Well, I don't know if he'll let me debate him. But there was only one uh, debate that was scheduled. Um, the League of Women Voters had one scheduled for October 20th. I enthusiastically agreed to go. I was really looking forward to this. However, just a few days ago, I was notified by the League of Women Voters that the debate has now been canceled. Uh, it's been canceled because not enough candidates. Actually, the, uh, the email said, due to lack of confirmed participants. Now, okay. myself and Stacy Stout both agreed to be there. Um, so if, if we had lack of confirmed participants, it would have been um, the Democratic... Peter Fisher, Peter Fisher and, and uh, Leon, Leon Lilly. Lilly. Right. But I don't know. I'll, I just know that I got the email that said um, it's been canceled due to lack of confirmed participants. Yeah. Okay. It's unfortunate. Yeah, it is. Okay, we have a caller. So, uh, caller, do you have a comment or question? You know, I, I do have a comment and a question. Okay. Um, Make it quick. Uh, it, it, that's right. Well, you know, uh, getting back to this idea, well, two things. Uh, you had mentioned that there was not enough confirmed candidates to hold the forum. Well, mm -hmm. it seems to be the trend this particular election that all the incumbents have decided that they don't need to debate in public to let people know exactly where they stand on the issues and that they'll just hide behind their title and their power because they're going to just coast in anyway. So uh, I, that's my one comment on that. That's, that's now, very true. The, the, the other comment I have is that uh, I, I am a, a DFL delegate. Uh -huh. And uh, one of the issues that I am very disappointed about with regard to the many of the incumbent DFL candidate, uh, candidates uh, that are running for a re-election is that they know that in the state of Minnesota here that HMOs are used to facilitate our, our Minnesota care for those who qualify. And it is no secret that the HMOs want to keep their books as secret as possible that they do not account for the dollars that they get for, from the state of Minnesota, and that this is an issue that is relevant whether or not if you are a Republican, a Democrat, a Green Party uh, supporter, it doesn't really matter what party you belong to, 
the accountability of Minnesota taxpayers' dollars with the HMOs that are charged with um, administering the programs that we have for those people who are deserving and qualify, it, it's a must. We need to have accountability. We right. need to have transparency yeah. in that. And I have not heard either Leon Lilly or Peter Fisher or any of the other incumbents right. talk about this as a number one issue, which should be their number one issue, rather than going around saying, yeah. well, I'm not going to go and debate anybody because I really don't have to. I stand on a pedestal. Uh, thank you, Carl. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. You know, this is, of course, this deals with the state auditor, right? but it's also the legislature putting pressure on the state auditor, and we haven't heard anything from Rebecca Otto. She's not showing up to debates or getting her face out there. Um, and uh, with, with health care, that's a big issue that needs to be audited. Right. You and know, it, I, I think that what the caller said is that it, it doesn't matter if you're a Republican right. or it doesn't matter if you're a Democrat. It's fair and reasonable for the taxpayers to be able to expect some accounting with the money that is, is being provided to right. anyone else. I, I guarantee you, in my opinion, Leon Lilly does not care. Uh, he, he doesn't care if money's wasted, he'll just raise taxes. Mm. He doesn't care about that. He doesn't care if it's been used. That's my opinion, but that's how I've seen him operate. Well, so. the... <laughs> uh, yep, well, I... And, and you would care. <laughs> right, yes, yes, I certainly would, and I do. Um, but here's the, the analogy that I like in this, too. No matter whether you're a Democrat or whether you're a Republican, uh, you know, if you think of all... We're all in the same boat. Uh, if Minnesota... Um, is a boat and we're all in the same boat and our right. boat has holes in it it's not going to do anybody any good to decide who put the hole there and, and how it got there we're all going down with the boat together well but so we need to uh, yeah, but do with, the right thing yeah but now, with the question an, then is <laughs> who's going to do the right thing yeah right and so if we had someone in office for 10 years who hasn't been doing the right thing and you look at the situation that we're at right now well yes it's time for it's time for a replacement and i'm going to be that replacement yeah so but I, I would say with holes in the boat, there are people benefiting yes. from those holes in the boat, and that's the type of person you want to watch out for. Okay. And, I, and I think that's what we have in our, in our system right now. And I think Leon Nelly is one of those persons that benefits from the holes in the boat. Oh, well, this is true. And uh, as I was working <laughs> as a consultant in uh, organizational leadership, I found that to be exactly the same thing. Uh, so one of the things I was on your show years ago, and one of the things I talked about was uh, there were, I don't know how many millions of dollars were given to employers that were supposed to be used to hire individuals on welfare. Mm -hmm. And the idea was right. the employers would train these individuals who are on welfare and give them a transferable skill. So we're talking pipe fitters, mm -hmm. uh, construction workers, computer networking, things like that. And that's how it was billed to the taxpayer. Mm -hmm. And I believed in that, and I was a job developer at the time, so mm -hmm. I would network with these employers. Mm -hmm. The problem was that the money never made it to the employers. The welfare organizations kept the money, and they created what I call phony jobs. Mm -hmm. So what they did was, uh, in my organization, they had someone sit at a table and watch a door, and then they called them a receptionist. The fact that he couldn't speak English didn't matter, but he got a kickback from the, the from the company, he got money, he, he got his job, mm -hmm. and then the uh, company got extra money because they could take $20 an hour and, uh, for what he's doing from this mm -hmm. program and pay him $10 an hour right. or $7 an hour or whatever. So I tried to blow the whistle, and this is the one of the problems, even if we audit, even if our auditor goes in there and audit, uh, which uh, the Department of Human Services uh, assured me that they were going to do, but it wasn't illegal. Mm -hmm. it, it was unethical what was was happening. First of all, mm -hmm. the individual in poverty didn't get his training like he was supposed to, and then uh -huh. the taxpayers were essentially being scammed and ripped off. Yeah. But it wasn't illegal. Yeah. So even if you audit the books, so that you're going to have to look at it more uh, in a, a little bit bigger picture. So uh, as far as a systemic problem, right? Yeah, we definitely got to audit. Yeah, our auditor needs to get in there. But it's really a larger systemic problem than that. Well, and Minsure is a perfect example. And it's only going to get worse with Minshear. Now, before, we'll get back to Minshear here, but um, I just found out last Friday, uh, I'm trying to get this person on the show, but this in, in this last week the news blew up about um, an, uh, 
organization that helps with heating bills, mm -hmm. uh, that gets state money, uh, heating bills, low income people, mm -hmm. that a lot of the money, 800,000 right. was used. Yeah, right. Are you familiar For, with yes, that? Yes, yes. Um, but this person that I'm trying to get on the show four years ago mm -hmm. went to the state auditor, went, was telling people there's a problem here and they told her to go away. Right. I don't want to know about it. Be quiet. Mm -hmm. That's my understanding of what took place. Finally, enough people raised the stink. It got to the press. Once it gets to the press and the press is willing to cover mm -hmm. it, right. which sometimes doesn't happen, then now it's been blown up and mm -hmm. now people are disassociating mm -hmm. with the organization representatives. Okay. This, yeah, what you're saying, that's a, a problem inherent with government um, when we have government programs. You know, if these, uh, the people administering that program had competitors uh, that they, and they had to please their clients that uh -huh. were using their services, uh, then they would be much more receptive. But the, the thing that happens uh, with the government programs is that the people that are receiving the benefits are not actually the clients. They're the beneficiaries of the program. Uh -huh, the right. client is the government. They're the ones paying the bills. The client right. is the one that pays the bills. Right. So the organization needs to make the client happy, which is the government. Whether the people who are benefiting from this program or not are happy is, is not as important right. as the fact that the client, the guy paying the bills, is happy. Yeah, you, you make that point very well. Um, and it keeps needing to be made. So back to Minsher here. Um, you know, we're talking about waste. I expect some waste. Right. There just has to be. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, you're not going to get things perfect, 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 but to the point where we're having a lot of fraud going on. There's a lot of there's a lot of hanky panky going on. So you know the, the Japanese call it muda, everything that doesn't add value to every input in a system. Um, so this is just uh, organizational uh, systems engineering speak. Uh, there is an okay. enormous amount of muda in, in Minshore. Mm -hmm. But w I think one of the things that needs to be hit on right away that the public doesn't seem to, to know is that even if you get on this, if you get on Minshore, the, you have, you technically you have insurance, but the deductibles are so extreme that you can't actually use it. Right. So the question then is, do you really have insurance? So if you're on the bronze plan, uh, what good is insurance if you can't yeah. use it? Uh, when we say we want to give people health care insurance, the reason is we want to give them so that they can use it. Mm -hmm. But if we kick the, uh, on the bronze plan from insured to individual, your deductibles are 5,000, mm -hmm. 5,000, uh, right? I think it's 10,000 for our family, and it doesn't get much better if you go to the silver plan. So we can... And so that's just there to it's a cover facade. foreign emergencies for bigger bills, it doesn't right. really provide, it's not there for day to day, and, but a person should have five to $10,000 already put aside in cash <laughs> or be able to build it back up over time. That's the kind of what that insurance is designed for, right. but when you're getting kicked off or your insurance coverage, or your people providing your insurance is uh, saying, no, we're not gonna do it anymore. Right. And so now you got people twice now maybe three times that have been kicked off their insurance and have to find it someplace so they're left out on the and, street. And it's extremely difficult to actually sign up for insure. So I had somebody call me um, and uh, I, I went to their home and spoke to them and uh, the gentleman said that he got a new job and the new job, so he lost his insurance from his, his private insurance. So he now needs to sign up for Minsure, mm -hmm. but he can't negotiate the website. It, he's going around for hours and hours and it's extremely frustrating. Well, he mm -hmm. finally finds out that he makes just a little bit too yeah. much to, to qualify for a subsidy. Uh -huh. And he can't, he can't get on it because it, it just doesn't work. So the big question that he's asking is, how do I get insurance? I'm required to get insurance, but the website's not working. Do I go and stand in line for hours at a time? Mm -hmm. You know, what do I do? Mm -hmm. well, so my, my answer to him was, well, that's the situation that we're all in right now. And it, it's just not working. But the very frustrating thing that people at the doors are telling me is, why is it that so many politicians are trying to claim that Minsure is a success? 
it, it, it Who, is not who's, a who's claiming it's a success? Right. Well, it can't be a Dayton is. Yeah, well, I'm sure yes. He is. Yes. Absolutely. Uh, but it's not. Uh, Governor Mark Dayton has claimed that it is a success. Do people really believe them, though? Are people out there believing that it's a success? Okay. Uh, actually, people who have not lost their insurance and are not on private insurance, so government employees, um, who didn't have their insurance changed at all, who didn't have their insurance changed at all. Uh, those are the ones that are telling me, ah, it's not so bad. But they don't know. But they don't know, exactly. So what's happening is... It didn't affect me, so who it, do I care about anybody But else? it sounds like a great idea, right? Let's get insurance for people. But it, it, think of it like this. Let's say the government makes, um, uh, makes a program called Make Friends with Minnesota. Mm -hmm. And then they take, for every 100 Minnesotans, they punch 99 in the face and shake hands with one. Mm -hmm. You're always going to be able to find one in 100 Minnesotans who are going to say, eh, it's not so bad. It's uh -huh. not that bad. <laughs> but the other ones are screaming, and like Minnesota has been screaming, yeah. this is terrible. Just in Minnesota alone, the average private... Uh, insurance premiums have gone up 47 percent. In Goodhue County, women in Goodhue County have the, the largest increase in their premium in the nation, 200 percent increase. Uh, uh, what hmm. is it that our politicians have against women in Goodhue County? Right. Uh, yeah. how, how is this a success? Wow. Uh, how is this affordable? I think the way... Well, because that, I say it is. Because someone named it Affordable Care Act, therefore it's affordable. No, it's not affordable. It, it is a complete and utter disaster. And uh, even if it had great intentions, it's simply not working. Okay. Yeah, no, no free market. And without a free market, it, it's, it's just not going to happen. Okay, we're running out of time here. So you got about a minute here to kind of wrap up and, and just say why people should vote for you. Well, you should vote for me because I'm going to do a great job. I care about people. I live what I say I believe. Mm -hmm. you know, I have an extensive background in, in helping people in the community. Mm -hmm. And you know, I have an extensive education in systemic change. So, you know, I worked as a systems engineer for organizations. And that's exactly what needs to be done at the state level. We need yeah. to get someone who understands Absolutely. inputs to outputs to a system and can uh, measure not just the outputs, but the continuous incremental improvement per input. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's just got to be done, and I don't know of anybody else at the Capitol that actually has that expertise. I don't know either, I d and I don't think there is. Um, but you also need a, a good hearted... Supposedly in the government, but right. you need the people that know how to hold people accountable right. and can talk the language and dig information out, and, and you're that kind of person. Yeah, and I also want to say I am not a party whip. I'm not going to vote party line. Mm -hmm. uh, I will vote my conscience. And, uh, you know, whether no matter what party out there insisting this needs to be get done, all right, I'm, I'm not a party whip. I'm going to be doing the right thing. And, and, and that's the key thing. What is the right thing? And, you know, uh, the, the principles of liberty, mm -hmm. the principles of uh, self-determination, and the principles of community, people helping each other right. freely, mm -hmm. not forcibly. I, I think you wrap all those things together and then you, then you will make the right decisions. That you'll make the decisions that people want to have. So, yeah, I'm looking forward to it. All right, yeah. all right. Thank you, Justice, for coming on. Thank you. Uh, let's switch to camera three here. You know, we got elections coming up November 4th. Obviously, I support Justice White Thorne over Leon Lilly. Uh, I hope you vote for him. Actually, I'm not going to be here next week. You know, we got to work on maybe getting you and Leon on for a debate. Uh, get somebody to moderate that. Yeah, that's, that's great. Let's do it. <laughs> you know, make sure it happens. Uh, we started that a little early, but um, hey. Um, We'll have more video coming on the Michelle McDonald arrest. Remember CPLaction.com where they're uh, trying to have in the sports in Minnesota have your children self-identify their gender and have boys and girls locker rooms and girls and boys locker rooms. It's bad. Contact your uh, CPL Action. Go to their webpage.com to find out what's going on there. People, you gotta, there's no time to sit down and ignore what's going on. You have to step up. All right, remember, if you don't stand for other people's liberties, who's gonna stand for yours? And good men don't do nothing.
God bless. Have a great week.